Auguste Comte is one of the most important and influential, yet surprisingly one of the least read of the great 19th century philosophers. He is generally regarded as the founder of positivism, a scientistic and naturalistic tendency in Western thought, and he also invented or developed the discipline of sociology, and much of modern social theory is indebted both to his nomenclature and to his presuppositions about the world and about our access to knowledge of human actions and institutions. Uh, Comte is not often read. He is little regarded in contemporary great books, syllabi, primarily because of the fact that his thinking is long, ponderous, involved, not terribly accessible. That's one problem. And the second problem is, is that Towards the end of his life, he became visibly insane. He, had, he suffered a sort of mental breakdown, and his work clearly shows the influence of this tragic mental collapse, which makes him an easy target for parody. He's almost a self-parody, and I'll try and discuss some of the, the difficulties that emerge in his later intellectual and psychological problems. But his early work is profound and brilliant. He has had an influence which is almost uncalculably important on the further development of the philosophy of science, the history of science, and the development of social science in the modern West. So for all these reasons, Comte is worth dusting off, taking off the library shelves, and inquiring into. We will find that a good bit of the contemporary world um, was formulated, at least the basic ideas of contemporary social science are formulated in Comte, and many of the conflicts that we see, uh, Comte lives uh, in the early part of the 19th century, he dies in 1857, he's roughly a contemporary of Marx, and we will f see certain similarities in the themes that they undertake and the way in which they attempt to uh, create a logic of historical development that will bear a considerable amount of comparison to Marx, to uh, Hegel, and to the tradition of French utopian socialism. Fourier is one of his students. Saint-Simon is connected with him. So that he is part of a general intellectual trend towards the systematizing of the human sciences and towards recognizing the profound effect that the industrial and scientific and technological revolutions have had on our conception of human beings and human society. We can never go back because the triumph of the modern natural sciences in, from the Enlightenment right up to the time of Comte himself is an irreversible process. We must now stop and take stock of the influence that this science has had on our understanding of knowledge and secondly, on our understanding of ourselves. Now there are four, at least four, evident and important influences on Comte's thought. Um, the first is Catholicism. He comes from an orthodox, royalist, Catholic family, extremely conservative and traditional. Uh, strangely enough, he is educated at a polytechnic university. And at this time, it creates a sort of polarization in his thought. At the one hand, he longs for the organic stability and unity characteristic of medieval Catholicism. He, uh, order and progress are the two great mottos which he introduces into his political theory. And order, the order, the static immobility characteristic of feudal Europe is something that he finds attractive and longs for. Comte was very much opposed to the Reformation, very much opposed to the French Revolution. He disliked disorder and he was attempting to create the possibility for human progress without the convulsive disorder that we find, say, in the wars of religion or in the French Revolution. So Catholicism and the order and structure that is entailed there is a big influence on his thinking. The second big influence comes from his polytechnic education. Modern natural science is a fundamental concern for him. He was an adept at all scientific disciplines within his view. He was, familiar, he was an expert mathematician. He had a natural gift for mathematics. He was well versed in contemporary physics. He studied biology. He studied chemistry. He was a polymathic intellect. Uh, in some respects he reminds me of Aristotle in the sense that he's pulling together all the different disciplines of his time and trying to synthesize and organize. Unlike Aristotle, he had a creative streak and alas, unlike other figures, he had a messianic streak, which came out late in his career. But at least initially, 
His project is to synthesize and unify the sciences as they have developed since the age of, say, Copernicus or Galileo. Pull them all together under the aegis of one intellectual structure, which validated and connected all of these disciplines. And he had hoped, once we f he had finished off the natural sciences, since he, o he made the ontological posit that nature was all there was, once you have unified and logically organized the natural sciences, you have logically organized all of knowledge. So there is a sense that he is a, the culmination of a certain kind of intellectual tradition. So modern natural science and its connection to religious belief was a, a source of persistent tension for Comte. A third big influence is the French Revolution. Comte disliked revolutionary convulsions on the whole. He was a very conservative, I might be tempted to almost say reactionary political thinker. And the French Revolution is his example of what must be avoided in our future political progress. In other words, although he admires order, he wants to allow for the for the introduction of salutary changes, but he wants to make sure that these salutary changes are not accompanied with the tremendous misery that was connected with things like the wars of, uh, of religion or with the terror of the French Revolution. The final great influence on Comte was the tradition of French utopian socialism. And in this respect, I would say that, uh, that he's responding to the same sort of dissatisfactions with industrial society that Marx was responding to, or in fact, that Charles Dickens was responding to. The social and familial dislocation characteristic of the new industrial society generated certain problems that traditional political theories were not capable of formulating or addressing. There's nothing in Aquinas that tells us um, that child labor is a bad thing. Right? Certain new problems are generated by the rise of science and the concomitant rise of industrial society, which Comte is confronting. And if his solutions to these problems is unsatisfactory, and I think for the most part it is, as is true generally for the whole tradition of utopian socialism, utopian being the operative word, well then, at least asking these questions represents a kind of a breakthrough. If his answers are not very satisfactory, the questions remain with us or minimally have to be reformulated because it's the, it, he's gesturing at the kind of problems we can't escape. They're a concomitant of the world we live in. Now, he never succeeded. He was always an intellectual outsider. And even early in his career, he began to show signs of mental disintegration. Psychologically, right, he had a great many difficulties in controlling his tendency towards delusion, particularly delusions of grandeur. And particularly g given the fact that he's an exceptionally gifted individual, I mean, a profoundly gifted mathematician, able to unify all the sciences, Right? This easily lends a man a sort of messianic tinge, and Comte was unable to, to get around that, particularly towards the end of his career. And if you just think about the project he is undertaking to unify all the sciences, it is a sort of monument to intellectual hubris. Right? I mean, in some ways, what's more, I don't know, uh, platonic in its aspirations? rather than its achievements, to take all the state of all knowledge, both physical and moral and political, and unify it under one, one singular, simple method, and then to show the connections between all, the, all of knowledge, and then, well, what is there to do? The rest of your life is essentially an anticlimax. What else can a man possibly uh, aspire towards if you're an intellectual than unifying all of knowledge? What else is there to do? Well, one of the difficulties for Comte is that he believes he succeeds in doing this early in his life. And this tends to reinforce his grandiosity. So things go from bad to worse along these lines. So to tease out the genuine intellectual achievements from the visibly pathological elements in his work is not easy. And I think that this helps account for his relative neglect, even though he is a very important thinker. Now, he was always an outsider, never able to get a university post um, because of his naturalistic inclinations, because of his reactionary political views, and also because of his personal craziness. He gave lectures personally in his apartment. He held a small soiree and had something like an intellectual salon. And it's surprising, although there was only a small number of people who attend his lectures over the course of 12 years, 
And these, these lectures are occasionally interrupted by his psych, you know, psych, uh, psychotic breaks. He is often suicidal. He's profoundly depressed. But when he is teaching, it's amazing the number of important intellectuals that come in. Fourier is one of his students, the famous utopian socialist. Von Humboldt, the German naturalist, comes to these lectures. Uh, John Stuart Mill, although he doesn't attend these lectures, is very much impressed by Comte's achievements. There are many important intellectual figures that have to kind of tip their hat to Comte's ambitions, if not to his resolution of these problems. So we have here the case of, a, of an unfortunate man who is mentally gifted and at the same time mentally diseased. And that causes his mental gifts and his mental diseases to grow apace. And that causes him to become uh, more and more the object of ridicule. Um, strangely enough, within France, Comte has almost no influence. Almost no Frenchman take Comte seriously. His influence is among scattered intellectuals in various countries and also uh, countries like Brazil that are outside the, the metropolitan area of Western culture, that are on the periphery of it. So Comte himself, uh, there's a saying that a prophet is without honor in his own country. Well, I would underscore the word prophet there. Um, he didn't have much honor within France. He wasn't very influential. But the few intellectuals that did take note of his work were justifiably impressed with its scope and with its ambition. Now, the first work that he produced was six volumes, The Course on Positive Philosophy. He formulates that between 1830 and 1842. It is a sort of a transcript or a reformulation of the lectures that he gives in his home. And in six volumes, it covers, well, all of natural science, which he understands to be all of science, which he understands to be all of knowledge. Because what he does is end up collapsing things like psychology into the behavioral sciences. And he ends up collapsing all of social science into one super science, the new discipline he founds, and he calls this discipline sociology. He views it as being something analogous to social physics. So Comte begins the, uh, the logical and at the same time a historical analysis of the development of, mo of human knowledge. And he tries to fill in the keystone in the arch, finishing off that project of the development of human self-consciousness and of consciousness of the external world. And there are two parts to his course on positive philosophy. The first part is a philosophy of history. The second part is an epistemological position. I'll start with the philosophy of history first, because that, in some ways, is the more interesting of the two, at least to me. I think if you ask Professor Staloff, right, it's the epistemology that is really the more interesting of the two. But it's a question of taste. The, the philosophy of history is a three-stage philosophy of history in which he tries to account for the necessary triadic development of all individual human civilizations and of the individual components, the conceptual components within a civilization. And the three stages are the theological stage, the metaphysical stage, and then the final positive stage, the age of Comte. So his view is that the dis is that all the elements of human knowledge, and what he means by these elements of human knowledge are mathematics, astronomy, uh, so, uh, physics, chemistry, physiology, and physiology is understood to subsume psychology because physiology will be or his psychology will be completely behavioristic, right, positivistic, and the final stage in the development of human thought is sociology. Human beings self-consciousness, their scientific understanding of the society that they participate in and into which they are incorporated. So there are six disciplines which encompass all of real scientific, real legitimate knowledge, and they are all unified. They all study the same thing, which is the real world, the world of space and time. And they study it not in the same way, because Comte has not gotten to the reductive positivism that we will see in the, in the Vienna Circle of the 20th century. For him, each of these disciplines has to develop its own canons of reasoning right, and its own procedures for developing legitimate knowledge. So in other words, sociology will not be reducible to physics for Comte in the way that it would, I think, be reducible for, uh, say, the early Wittgenstein or any of the hardcore positivists like Carnap or Schlick or Ayer. Right? For him, there is a kind of natural kinds. They break up into natural divisions. And, these natural, and, and, the and the divisions between logic correspond to ontological distinctions. I guess that's one of the holdovers of scholasticism that we see in Kant. Or in Comte. Now, let's think about these phases. 
Each of the individual disciplines has to go through these three phases, and all cultures must go through these phases as well. The first phase is the theological phase. And if you think about it, there's a good, I mean, this is not a, at all an implausible set of ideas. In the most ancient strata of human history and of human society, knowledge is always bound up with myth. When the ancient sages studied astronomy, astronomy and astrology were the same discipline, right? They weren't separate. When you looked at a, con uh, at a collection of stars and you said, that is the lion, that is Leo, well, this is probably connected with some lion myth, right? And there will always be some sort of mystical, mythological element been built into their early primitive astronomy. And if you think about the development of physics, the earliest physics is also couched in mythology. The earliest mathematics, if you think about something like uh, the theorem of Pythagoras, when a squared plus b squared equals c squared, when that fact came to Pythagoras, he went out and sacrificed an ox to Apollo. Why? Because mathematical knowledge comes from the gods. So there is a considerable justification for, this, for Comte's idea that the origin of all our knowledge of the external world and perhaps of whatever other knowledge might be conceived of as legitimate, I won't restrict us to that Comtean view yet, um, there is considerable grounds for believing that these all go through a sort of theological phase, a mythological phase, in which we attribute to them anthropomorphic personality, intentionality, right? If you think about uh, the fact that in ancient Greece, if a statue fell on, fell on someone, you could hold the statue responsible. Well, that is a holdover from this magic thinking, right? It is a, a, an, an artifact of that primitive theological physics. So Comte's argument, for example, that mathematics and astronomy and chemistry and physics and physiology and sociology, theories of society, all go through these, that, that initial theological phase. I think there's good reason to believe that. So for Comte, and remember that he is a priest pre-Darwinian, right? He dies in 57, 1859, Darwin publishes Origin of Species. So one of the key building blocks of what we would consider the, the hard shell positivism of the Vienna Circle isn't there yet. He doesn't have a way of conclusively reducing organic um, living matter to some sort of blind, mechanical, naturalistic process. That's one of the reasons why he keeps them ontologically and logically separate. But if you were to say to take roughly, I mean, without inquiring too much into the origins of humanity for Comte, I mean, if you were to say roughly the time from the cave paintings that we see in those ancient you know, bis uh, bison on the walls of caves, uh, that that is a, a representation of the early theological stage. And this, this theological kind of knowledge continues right down through Western culture, but also I think Comte would be inclined to describe this as true of all cultures, right into the age of European feudalism. Right? We're still talking about science and about mathematics and about physiology in a theological way. We are still using a theological vocabulary, theological categories, things like that. And Comte says, while this is a noble and necessary process, right, it has to be superseded because it just doesn't work, which is a very good reason to believe it. Um, his influence on pragmatism is often ignored and it's actually quite significant. What works is what counts for Comte. Now, within this this first stage, the theological stage, he, like Hegel, or particularly like Vico, those of you who know Vico's stages from the, the age of the gods to the age of the heroes to the age of men, will find an almost perfect symmetry between this tripartite development. Well, what we'll find here is that within this first phase, there are a number of subphases which also appear to be, roughly speaking, necessary. The first phase is what he calls the fetishistic phase, in which you attribute to special rocks or special trees, if you think of the religion of the Druids, special magical powers. Powers, the power to give you good weather or bad weather, things like that. He says that that's the earliest and most primitive phase, fetishism. The second phase will be the transformation of fetishism into polytheism. Best example here would be Homer, or uh, it's also where you place something like Hinduism. And the third phase within this theological stage of development is monotheism, which is what he sees as being the great contribution of the Judeo-Christian tradition. It is the highest of the theological phases because it is the most unified it is the most elegant, and it is the one that sets the preconditions for the movement into the next stage, which is the metaphysical stage. Now, for Comte, the metaphysical stage differs from the theological stage in that it accounts for, and it accounts for the world around us, not with these anthropomorphic entities, the, the tree god and the stone god and the sky god. It accounts for these things using intellectual abstractions, like forces, causes, rights. And for Comte, everything I would say between Plato and the French Revolution are examples of metaphysical thinking. What's, what's an example of a metaphysical thing in Comte's sense of the term? Um, the Platonic forms, well, everybody agrees that those are metaphysical. Um, 
say, the essences and existences of the scholastics, clearly metaphysical. Uh, Descartes' clear and distinct ideas, metaphysical abstractions. Uh, it's another example. Rousseau's idea of natural rights, metaphysical abstractions. So he wants to get rid of all that stuff and move on to the next necessary phase, which is the positive phase. And the positive phase is the phase of society where we get rid of all these explanatory abstractions. We no longer use that sort of abstract thinking as a, as a way of accounting for the world. Instead, what you see is what you get. Positivism simply says there's no need to posit things like forces, laws, the, the theory of forms, essences and existences, none of that scholastic stuff. Get rid of it all. All posit positivism says is that what you see is what you get. The world is what it appears to be. It essentially undoes the distinction between appearance and reality, which had been central to the whole Western tradition for the previous, what, 23 centuries at least. By undoing this distinction between appearance and reality, what Comte offers us is simple regularities, mathematically expressed laws that tell you what goes on in the world. If you want to know what really happens in the world, well, watch it, and watch it again, and watch it again, and then make some law-like generalization about it, and then have special scientists bring these generalizations together so that what you get is things like F equals MA. Very nice. L small, math uh, compact, precise mathematical representations. In principle, um, certainly physics is susceptible to that. Astronomy has gone through these three phases. Physics has gone through these three phases. With Harvey finding the circulation of the blood, physiology went through these three phases. What Comte believes that he is doing is finishing off. He is taking the earlier social theories of Aristotle and Plato and Aquinas and all the great thinkers that preceded him and bumping them out of, in, into an, a new level of sophistication. The, all these earlier thinkers, especially thinkers about society and about politics and about ethics, as well as thinkers about epistemology, were either these primitives caught up in the theological level, or they were a kind of transitional intellectual, set of intellectual amphibians who were caught up in the metaphysical level. But the key problem that we have is that Comte says, I, Auguste Comte, am now going to be the first positivist sociologist. I will tell you what all human society amounts to, and I'm not going to fall into these metaphysical abstractions that you are. I'm just going to say that all the sciences are unified, and because physics and chemistry and mathematics have all gone through these phases, the last of the elements of knowledge, sociology, knowledge of human society, must also necessarily go through this phase. Now this is a very intriguing idea, and there's a considerable amount of truth in it. In other words, I have found many of these ideas fruitful and useful when inquiring into world history. When teaching it and organizing it within my own thinking, I have found many of these ideas worthwhile if you don't press them too hard. The difficulty is, is that like Hegel, Comte seems to be erecting a structure right, which is final. In other words, all the previous historical and logical development of our species leads up to him. He is the uniquely omniscient self-consciousness of our species, which has finally liberated us from the bondage of metaphysics and theology. Finally, we are free. There is a deeply troubling messianic element to this. Right? Um, Hegel also has that tendency, but the fact that Hegel is a Lutheran makes him a little bit more restrained in the messianic tendencies of this. Um, it, in some ways, the difference between Comte and Hegel is similar to the difference between Mozart's Requiem and Verdi's Requiem. Both of them talk about final, eternal things, but there's more of a sense of restraint, uh, that North German Protestant tendency that we find in Mozart. It's more restrained and square. Verdi's Requiem, which is a little, a little bit after the time of Comte's death, is an extremely Catholic version of the same thing. It talks about final issues, ultimate reality, but it's all over the place. It is huge and overwrought. There's too much of everything. There's a loss of a sense of proportion here in Comte. And the difference between Comte and Hegel is that it becomes very, very obvious in Comte, whereas Hegel finds ways of restraining these sorts of um, these tendencies towards omniscience. So these three phases are very important to Comte's thinking, and we will find that with some adjustment, this will have a considerable influence on the future development of 
social thought and historical thought. Um, if you know the lectures that Professor Staloff gave on uh, history and approaches to history, if you think of somebody like William McNeil, a very positivistic contemporary historian, assuming that the world is nature, well, if you get rid of Comte's disdain for non-Western cultures, which I think is one of the greatest flaws in his thinking, there's a sort of racism and a sort of Eurocentrism which is both unattractive and false. But if you were to get rid of that and be a little more Catholic, a little more universal in your appreciation of the kind of technological and sociological developments in non-Western cultures, um, I think that there is a considerable argument to make along these lines. All of the world's great cultures had a theological phase. Ma some of them are still, or all of them to some extent, ha maintain con uh, connections to that. Many of them, for example, Greece or the Greco-Roman tradition, also go through a theological phase. Think of scholasticism. So we get a theological phase, we get a metaphysical phase. The final phase, the positive phase, is caught up with the idea of the advance of modern natural science. And if you notice how modern natural science has, at least within the elites across the world, become a sort of unifying ideology, the logical coherence of this becomes quite impressive. And it turns out to be, with some caveats, a very useful set of intellectual categories. So Comte and his theory of the development of the human mind, while it has elements of grandiosity, certain elements which are very disturbing, um, there is a germ of truth here, and it must be recognized. It's really worth thinking about. And if you can extract the sensible stuff from the crazy stuff, I think we're at something of an advantage. Now, connected with these theories of historical development, like Hegel, is a, th is a theory of epistemology, the logical development of the sciences. Each of the sciences is connected by the fact that it refers to the same thing, the external world, reality, the world of space and time. And they have logical and historical relations to each other. You can't move astronomy from the theological to the metaphysical to the positive stage until mathematics does that first. So math has to come first. There's a definite logical hierarchy and historical hierarchy there. Once math starts to go through that process of development, then it's possible for astronomy to go through that development. Once astronomy starts to go through that development, then physics can start to go through that development, and then chemistry can start to go through that development, and then physiology can go through that development, and then we get Comte, who's finishing the project. The keystone goes into the arch. The progress of the human mind culminates with Comtean sociology. Right? So you can see how one is contingent upon the other, and there's a considerable amount of truth in that. It is not surprising if you look back on the, and the, this has been very influential in the history of science, it's not surprising that the Greeks made great advances in mathematics before we were able to make great advances in quantum mechanics. It is pretty clear that quantum physics is dependent upon certain mathematical instruments which have to be developed first. Right? So, and it's not surprising that we don't develop a very sophisticated physiology until breakthroughs are made in physics and chemistry. So there is a, a certain cunning of the insane. There is a profound brilliance here. And it is worth our while to think about the kind of way in which he's organizing this. I would be inclined to say that in some ways he's like Aristotle, unifying all the knowledge of his time. You might, I would be tempted to say that this is the true new organon. Remember Bacon writes a book called The New Organon? This is the real new organon. This makes Bacon look like small potatoes. He's a halfway point between uh, someone like Lucretius, the Roman Epicurean, who's a, also a materialist, and uh, Carnap, who goes for the real hard shell positivism. So he's the, the, the connecting link between the naturalistic, uh, atomistic tendencies of the ancients and the modern tendency to, to derive all real knowledge from a scientific basis that we see in things like uh, the Vienna Circle and the early Wittgenstein. So his early work is two things. It's a philosophy of history, and at the same time it's an epistemology, and these things tend to merge. Within concrete historical events, the logic and the, hist and, and the necessary historical development manifest themselves. You can see resonances of Hegel here. Now, this is the part of positivism which most contemporary positivists, or most contemporary naturalistic thinkers, like in Comte. And there were some of his followers after he died that wanted his work to be uh, cut away, they wanted it boulderized, they wanted it censored, because they thought that after this first, this initial work, the uh, theory of positive philosophy, that he just went visibly crazy, and that this, uh, the stuff that comes after that is visibly inferior and different from this particular approach to nature and knowledge. So there is one reading of positivism, the reductive reading. These are the spiritual grandfathers of Carnap and Schlick and Neurath um, that want 
positivism and Comtean philosophy to be limited to this book and to this outlook. Comte himself, on the other hand, did not. And another group of his followers, I think that the people for whom the attraction to Comtean philosophy was the possibility of reconciling moral order and political order with the advent of modern science, another group of, of followers of Comte liked that tendency in Comte. And they're the ones who emphasized the legitimacy and importance of his later work. And the last of his works, or the, the last thing he finished, was the system of, of positive politics. And this was produced between 1851 and 54. And as Comte himself said, you cannot separate the philosophy from the polity. In other words, this is a theory of history and a theory of knowledge, but it also is a normative theory about how societies ought to be run and how I could improve upon the society we happen to have. Remember, he's living in the shadow of the French Revolution. He is terrified by the revolutions of 1848. And what he wants to do is impose an old-fashioned, backward-looking, organic order on this very dynamic society. So Comte, in that respect, is a reactionary thinker looking back to an er with a nostalgia for a lost innocence, to an earlier time when we had an organic unity to society. And the argument that he makes is that in the process of human development, not only have human beings developed their reasoning capacities, but they've also developed their sentiments. That the progress of human existence has been an intellectual progress, but also a moral progress, a progress of the moral sentiments. The law of love has been expanded and universalized. Christianity, which he kind of tips his hat to, is an early primitive development, a mythological formulation of the true law of love, which he somehow believes can be derived from his political and epistemological stance. I think that modern positivists, with some justice, don't believe that you're going to be able to get that normative element out of a purely naturalistic world. And Comte himself does dodge the conflict between is and ought, which becomes such an, such an important question in Hume's morals and Hume's politics. And the way in which he dodges this distinction between is and ought is by constructing a sort of cult of reason. Um, even though he would be loath to admit it, Comte is very much indebted to the cult of reason that comes from the Jacobins of the French Revolution. And he makes a sort of hybrid between the Jacobin cult of reason and the civil religion that Rousseau introduces at the end of the, uh, what's his famous book, uh, The Social Contract? Remember that there's a, social, uh, a civil religion, very simple and elementary, at the, at the end of his work? I think what he's doing is borrowing that tendency. It seems that many French thinkers cannot imagine a society in which you don't have a religion, which I think may be testimony to the tremendous influence of Catholicism in the French intellectual tradition. It's hard for them to imagine a stable polity that doesn't have some sort of religious foundation. Even a guy as skeptical and as revolutionary in some ways as Rousseau can't imagine it. So Comte picks up on that tendency. What he founds is something he calls the religion of humanity. And here's where things get, uh, I think, visibly psychotic and where I think it's a little too easy. I'll try and go easy on Comte because it's too easy to make this appear ridiculous. He did such a good job of it himself. The first thing Comte does is construct this new ersatz Catholicism by leaving out essentially the Jesus stories and by introducing his own conception of right and wrong, which he somehow takes to be canonical and authoritative. In other words, to call him the, the new pope of this new religion doesn't quite do him justice. He's more like the new messiah of this new religion. Right? And he elects himself to both of these disciplines, or to both of these stations, and he begins to, to sign his letters um, with the modest title that he gave himself, once again, High Priest of the Religion of Humanity, which makes his correspondence uneasy, because it's pretty clear that you're dealing with someone whose, whose brain is starting to go. I mean, I mean John Stuart Mill said it's a, it's a really melancholy sight to see a great intellect in such a state of decay. Because clearly he's gone off the deep end. He thinks that he's God's chosen, or more precisely, since there's no God around, I mean, no metaphysical realm, he sort of is God. He's the auto, he, he's the auto, he's the self consciousness of our species, and his religion of humanity is humanity worshiping itself. In other words, each individual, per one of us, as a sort of cell in this eternal species being, in other words, it takes up Marxist and Hegelian re uh, resonances, saying that our real existence is not the individual body that we are, but rather our existence is a species which goes on forever. Well, he says, I'll give you a new ersatz alternative to the Christian offer of immortality. Do good while you're here on earth, be virtuous, and you will live on forever 
in the memory of those who love you. There is, I mean, crazy as this seems, there's an element of truth in this. I mean, in other words, it's hard to separate the, the crazy stuff from the almost pedestrian observation that, well, if you do want any kind of immortality and you don't believe in a second world and in a heaven, the closest you're going to come is immortality in speech, immortality in collective memory. I mean, in other words, that's not so obviously crazy as the idea that, well, I'm going to lay down the laws of how and we will achieve a secular immortality and who's going to be immortal and why. He goes pretty far beyond this. He decides to reorganize the entire calendar and as an, instead of having saints days, we're going to have the days in tribute to the great philosophers and thinkers and literary figures. And this is a genuinely crazy idea. So we have the month of Moses. Why? Because Moses was a great guy. He deserves his own month. In the same way that the Romans decided that they could name their months after guys like Augustus and Julius Caesar, that's where we get July. He says, no, that, that, that shows a typically Roman lack of taste. Us smart, positivistic guys are going to name our calendar months after the great thinkers like Moses or Descartes or Newton. And they'll be, of course, in a natural progressive order because the month will be a microcosm of all of historical time. And in addition to that, different feasts will be celebrated in honor of particular problems that we have, and there'll be a ritual associated with this. It'll turn into an, uh, the uh, various kinds of ceremonies will be associated with celebrating the memory of these great men. There will be a cer certain set of books which will be canonical for all positive thought. And of course, here's the last of these books that we really need to read is Comp's work himself, because he's finishing all this off. It is pretty clear that what we have here is a combination of great insight and delusions of grandeur. He elects himself pope to a religion he starts, and he, expects the he literally expects positivism to supersede monotheism. In some ways, there's a kind of crazy, Promethean, almost Nietzschean will to take everything to its maximum extreme, except that the insanity of it becomes so much more visible. He's totally unselfconscious about seeming crazy because he's completely convinced that he has the final right answer. Of course, there are things that he doesn't consider. How do we know that the positive stage is the last one? I mean, if it's an inductive, empirical activity, who knows what's going to come tomorrow? I mean, think of the problems that are built into induction. How do you know it's going to be the end? He feels called and chosen. That's all you can say. He's quite convinced that he never confronts that sort of a problem. Let me take two tacks on this, finishing up. Let's try, first of all, the charitable reading, right, which is not my strong point. But let me, let me try. Charitable reading of Comte is that he's basically a humane person. In his religion of humanity, he tells people his, his moral injunctions to things like, love your neighbor and live for others. Well, I mean, I can kind of see this as a kind-hearted man. He doesn't seem to me um, malicious. He does seem to me to have lost a sense of his own proportion, but that is perhaps a tragic result of making a Faustian bargain. Those people in the Western tradition who are really under the misapprehension that they have the capacity to unify all of knowledge and to account for all previous logical and historical developments as leading up to them, have made a pact with the devil one way or another. It is literally insane to believe that you can do that. And to attempt to do it is in some ways noble and heroic in a Greek sense, in the sense that it is full of hubris and there's a certain sort of intellectual sin of pride in that. And at the same time, there's a kind of tragic nobility to it. He is trying to do more than anyone could possibly do. He has constructed a cold and austere and harsh Cartesian universe and at the same time, he longs for a sort of Pascalian moral order. And the problem is, the human mind just isn't big enough to do that. Even a huge mind like his can't do the job. And so you see him in a kind of tug of war between his desire for moral order and his desire for logical clarity. And the problem is, he pulls so hard in this tug of war that the rope snaps. And alas, we have here a tragic Faustian figure who might have been a great man, intellectually, but never realized his tremendous intellectual potentials because of this unfortunate lapse into madness. That's the charitable reading. The uncharitable reading is he's crazy from the word go. And I think there's a lot to be said for that, too. He exhibits paranoid symptoms very early. Um, his first intellectual mentor after he leaves the uh, Polytechnic Institute is uh, Saint-Simon, one of the great French utopian socialists. And after a long and close connection in which they express considerable admiration for each other, they engage in mutual accusation of stealing each other's ideas. Comte accuses Saint-Simon, his mentor and employer. Uh, Saint-Simon accuses Comte, and they break permanently. 
And of course, there are clear similarities between the thinking of Saint-Simon and Comte. Saint-Simon wanted the world ruled by what he called the Council of Newton, the 21 smartest scientists. Well, Comte offers to do something similar. During the revolutions of 1848, he's terrified by the prospect of new political disorder in Europe. He says, now that I've thought about it, perhaps we should have the entire world ruled by what I will call the positivist council. And you can imagine who's going to preside over this council. Comte. So with some reluctance, he offers himself as a kind of, kind of being drafted on, on the convention floor. He's willing to rule the world because the world really needs him. You can see that there are delusions of grandiosity here, right? Feelings that the, world, the rest of the world is at least sufficiently knowledgeable and sufficiently reasonable and sufficiently amenable to salutary change that they can see that the revolutions of 1848 are a mistake. What they really need is to be run by the smartest guy around. There's a sort of platonic element here. I would say that Comte is reacting to the new physics in the same way that Plato is reacting to the physics of the Milesians and trying to arrest the centrifugal tendencies that come out of that. In Plato's case, it's a lot easier to formulate a new religion because he's at a time when religion is more, uh, is more a part of the regular intellectual life of the high culture. By the time of Kant, by the early 19th century, the project of reinvigorating the traditional religion and making it logically consistent or logically uh, satisfactory to the currents of scientific thought at the time. It's just too late by the early 19th century. Plato is the last guy that could really try and pull that off. Comte is trying to do what nobody could have done. There's a sort, certain sort of heroic nobility to this. It's sort of like Sisyphus, or perhaps that's a little too harsh. He's trying to do more than a human being possibly can. It's heroic in the Greek sense, right? But it's just so full. He's a monster of intellectual hubris, right? much more, more so than Faust himself in that respect. Uh, so the uncharitable reading is that he was crazy from the beginning, that he elected himself pope to his own private religion, and actually not pope but messiah, and the fact that certain people were willing to reinforce his delusions does not make them any, more, any less delusional. So that would be the harsh reading of Comte, and I think that accounts for the fact that many contemporary social scientists who are indebted to Comte to a degree they do not realize tend to ignore this. This doesn't make itself make its way onto many great book syllabi, and in fact it should because it's quite influential. Let me talk about some of the influences in the modern world so I can give you a sense of why I think this is so important. In the first case, it seems to me that the problems of method, of unifying the sciences around one common method and around one common object of inquiry, nature, is one of the most important tendencies in the philosophy of science since the time of Comte. If you think about the idea of a unified science which animated the Vienna Circle, think of Mach and Avenarius at the end of the 19th century. Um, I think he also had a tremendous influence on pragmatism because he had essentially a pragmatic standard of knowledge. Does it work? Well, then it's real positivistic knowledge. Don't give me any metaphysical element. Just tell me if it works or not. So I think he's very influential on pragmatism. He's also quite influential on Herbert Spencer and the development of things like social Darwinism. Right? This hard-headed attempt to describe society as it actually is, independent of any metaphysical abstractions, is not so far from the early position that Comte takes. In addition to the problem of method and the unification of the method, um, the elimination of metaphysics, another theme that's going to come up again and again. Those of you know, that know A.J. Ayer's book, Language, Truth, and Logic, what's one of the, I mean, it's a great positivist manifesto. What does he do in the first chapter? The elimination of metaphysics. Well, Comte had done that already. Right, so it's not unique, it's just a reworking of something that's already there. The philosophy of history, I think his technocentrism is absolutely crucial. In other words, I was, last couple of years when I was at Johns Hopkins, I was teaching the history of the world. And when I was trying to formulate the connection, I mean, finding some way to get this mass of information together, the theme that I chose was the relationship between human beings and nature, because it's really there, which is very handy for our purposes. So I think that there's a, a big future in that idea that technocentric interpretation of history, if we leave out the Eurocentrism and racism that's characteristic of, Com of Comte's more reactionary tendencies. Um, he's worth comparing to William McNeil in that respect, a very hard-headed naturalistic approach, positivistic arguably. Another problem that he addresses, if he doesn't solve, is the problem of positivistic moral and political theory which is always the Achilles heel of these guys. If you find that all the great empiricists, all the guys who like that tables and chairs, space and time kind of philosophy, uh, what is it that uh, Edmund says at the begin in that soliloquy in King Lear, thou nature art my goddess, and to thy law my services are bound? Well, all of positivism is a sort of hymn, nearer my physics to thee. It's all physics worship. 
And the problem is, is that if you don't worship yourself, you don't worship humanity, what do you worship? And if you don't worship anything, well then what will your normative theory look like? What will your ethical theory look like? It'll be a big vacuum. Isn't that the, the weakest part of things like the Vienna Circle? You, somebody like Schlick's book on the problems of morality from the perspective of a positivist, it's really lame. It convinces no one, it inspires no one, and it's certainly the Achilles heel of all these naturalistic approaches to, the, to philosophy. Now, uh, granted that we don't want, or, or I don't want anyway, to adopt Comte's religion of humanity. It does beg the question of what you do want to adopt. All these hard shell 20th century positivists might want to look at that. And since positivism itself breaks down due to the influence of Gödel's the theorem and various other logical developments, um, what we get out of this is pragmatism. Right? In other words, I think that if you scratch um, the, the first layer of, of varnish off a pragmatist, what you'll find is a positivist with a broken heart because they don't get what they want. And if you want to find the Achilles heel of these pragmatists, you go to their moral theory because they don't have anything intelligent to say. Now that can be seen as uh, a virtue. It can also be seen as a vacuum. I prefer the latter. A final set of observations. It has had actual practical influence. The government of Brazil, right, I mean, th they have the positivist flag. It says order and progress. Right after the abolition of slavery in 1888, positivists were very influential in developing the new Brazil. For better or worse, it is a kind of transition between Catholicism and its universal moral order and the technocratic scientistic element that is becoming more and more influential among all the elites in every kind of government. And the final observation I'll make is that I think that all technocratic tendencies in modern politics owe something to Comte. In other words, there are, he was right in saying that, to a great extent, political decisions are at least partially technical. If you think about something like the Federal Reserve Board, we have a special group of economists there that decide things like how much money gets printed or what the interest rates are because of the fact that you and I have no idea what to do with that. I don't understand the equations, neither do you. There's no point in having me vote on these things because I don't understand them and neither do you. You can only leave it to the technicians and hope they do a good job. Because of the proliferation of knowledge in the modern world, it's not possible for any of us to know all the things we'd have to know to make an informed decision. The consequence of that is that positivism in the form of technocracy is at least a live option in the 20th century. The problem is how they will find a normative basis for that.